Welcome. Um, good afternoon. I'm Olga Olker. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program at CSIS. I'll be moderating this uh, very interesting um, panel this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, just a quick administrative note uh, in case of emergency. I will also be the person giving you instructions, but you can see the exit signs and so forth. So um, thrilled, as always, to welcome Leonid Grigoryev uh, to CSIS. Uh, Leonid is um, Chief Advisor to the head of the Analytical Center for the Government of the Russian Federation, which uh, does a lot of the number crunching and thinking through things um, for Russia. He's also a professor and director of uh, Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs at the School of World Economy at the Higher School of Economics, and served as a Deputy Minister of Finance uh, for Russian President Boris Yeltsin. He's also a very prolific um, producer of books, uh, papers, um, and fairy yeah, tales. And fairy tales. Um, you can check out his website. Um, <laughs> but uh, today he'll be he'll be talking about uh, income inequality in Russia. Now, um, because we want to make sure that this is a discussion, we invited a discussant, uh, Yuval Bubber, who is uh, the very first Daniel Morgan Graduate School Kennan Institute Fellow. Uh, he has been a, a professor at the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs at National Research University, the Higher School of Economics. Um, and he's been an associate at the Davis Center at Harvard University um, and a visiting assistant professor at the government department there. Um, so I'm going to give Leonid the floor for a bit. Uh, then we'll turn to Yuval, and then we'll have a conversation. So I'm not going to take any more time. Okay. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, well, I have long presentations, but I use CNN approach, not current CNN, we all CNN approach. Uh, so I'm showing some slides, uh, don't read them, and talking something different. Normally people can accommodate the conflict of information. Uh, but since 25 minutes for the presentation is a very short time, let me give three, four verbal conclusions. Uh, conclusion number one, uh, Soviet society was quasi egalitarian but the whole current uh, inequality in Russia for made, uh, uh, had been formated in the 90s, and it's rigid and didn't change during the upturn of 2000, early 2000, later, whatever. It's basically the same. It came with privatization, uh, the uh, crisis of minus 43% GDP, and privatization, uh, which produced oligarchs, everybody, uh, in the academic circles love Russian privatization, but don't love uh, Russian oligarchs. I don't understand it. It's, it's the same process. It produced uh, private economy and oligarchs. It was this style. Uh, second point, of course, we are dependent on oil, and a recent, uh, recent and essentially uh, recession of 2014-16, uh, it's so-called L recession, uh, so the uh, steep decline and kind of um, growing, uh, but unstable growing. We had ups and downs. It's difficult for everybody. Uh, informal evaluation of the factor of sanctions, because it's inevitable question, was given by some dep one pr deputy prime minister in uh, Valdai Club in Sochi in October. I'm not sure it was Chatham House or televised, so I, I, skipped his, I will skip his name. Um, uh, he gave it one percentage point of GDP, uh, value of sanctions, minus, of course. Um, most of Russian economists consider sanctions as a miracle in disguise in many respects. I leave it for questions. Uh, I need to create. And finally, we do have a problem with um, investments and consumption now on, uh, in the recovery, uh, but that requires certain demonstrations. Since I'm uh, sitting my back to the mm. presentation, uh, what I'm pressing? No, not sure. Uh, which button? Ah, by star. Yeah, ah, I see. It's unusual. Uh, 
Um, I will not even look at the, uh, everybody can read it in a few seconds. So Russian, Russian economy, current Russian economy, uh, we have a debate uh, now between reformers and academics, how much the current market economy depended on the Soviet times, on the um, 90s, and on uh, later reforms. Uh, two things for sure. Uh, the key element of the market economy ownership was formated in the 90s. And social structure reflects the uh, property rights and the distribution of property and corporate governance formated in the 90s. For example, uh, we don't have any mass, private, uh, mass uh, shareholding. Uh, uh, certain points in the, Yeltsin promised one million shareholders in a year or something like that. It never happened. We don't have shareholding. Um, uh, uh, control package in Europe, 53% on average, there is a book on it. Uh, in the United States, average 8.5% uh, first package. In the United Kingdom, 14, in Russia, 75. So we don't have free float. Everything kept tight. So we don't have uh, financial markets. So most of interesting features of Russian economy, its structural features, ownership and uh, social structure, came from 90s. Ah, OK. Uh, probably everybody. No. If it goes. No, it's still. Technical you still need better hands with mine. You mean uh, this one? Yeah, it's right. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a this is a history of Russia, uh, and you can easily uh, see what was going on for. Uh, for the 20th century and beginning of the 8th century. And uh, Russia is, uh, was in a steep decline. We have a piece of Soviet Union and so on. Uh, this is a, a pretty well-known uh, graph. It's all published in my works and others. Uh, uh, it's, it's a cyclical process. We are approaching the United States to one third and dropping down because of war or revolutions. Uh, very interesting, we made it just for fun. How deep was the crisis and how we recovered uh, by 28, uh, 2008. And uh, we basically very slow growth after that and changes in many, many respects. That's very educative. Uh, of course, we need uh, uh, I, I made the presentation of my book recently with Vyas and, and my point was we uh, actually tried to jump across the river in two jobs, not in one. So we made one job, landed in between, now we still need to crawl out. Uh, just for record, uh, I bring this slide once a year. Uh, this is, was condition of a society. We had uh, tripling uh, rate of suicides and homicides. Uh, Russian society in the 90s was basically destroyed. Uh, army was destroyed, fleet never, navy didn't go to uh, seas and so on. It was kind of a mess. Uh, inequality in general is now um, a fancy topic. Uh, I, my first work on inequality was presented in, in 2011 in Sao Paulo for International Political Science Association. We were worked uh, long before Piketty made it fashion. Uh, and uh, I believe um, inequality, growing inequality is normal for the market economy at the time of upturns. It reduces a little bit in crisis, normally grows, and uh, nothing, nothing dramatic about it. Uh, in the Russian case, ah, it's another slide uh, for current time. Uh, so basically, we came to the norm, uh, statistical norm of suicides and homicides, which was 30 years ago at the late of Soviet times. Maybe it's something specific for the country. 
Uh, I will not read the long tables. Look uh, just on the top. Uh, the structure of a society basically defined no, not by Gini coefficient, it's, it's just for academics. Uh, uh, look at the share of the uh, highest, uh, richest 20% or richest 10%. This is the, all the variations. Here is the all variation between countries. Uh, the problem with Russian uh, inequality uh, it's close to Latin America, it's close to Anglo-Saxon, but with low uh, intensity vertical lifts. So it's rigid. Because of, <laughs> because of privatization and corporate, and corporate control structure. Uh, the same in the condensed form. So there is no big difference in numbers, but Anglo-Saxon society gives lifts. Uh, personal consumption, here what's interesting, uh, all middle income countries have very high uh, share of durables. And I will show you a couple slides uh, with a consumer durables boom in Russia. Uh, this is for record. Russia is not a uh, socialist country. It's exactly in between. The most countries which are advertising um, uh, equality and everything on the bottom. It's Greece, Hungary, Portugal, Latvia, and so on. Uh, most uh, countries, uh, rich countries with high redistribution, the population is against redistribution. But it's that country with uh, flat, uh, flat distribution, a huge redistribution via taxes. Uh, this is a result of the boom of 2010-2014. Because we had low GDP growth, but rent was high, and oil rent was high. And normally people believe that rent was used for pensioners, for defense, and for taking out of the country. That's true. Uh, but uh, uh, miraculously, Russian propaganda overlooked the fourth source. They had huge. Uh, durable, uh, durable goods boom, huge. And we renovated cars, uh, five years by three million cars, new cars, 10 to 40. Uh, uh, normally that's two million for the, that country with our roads. Uh, we uh, reached top possible by computers access and since uh, Russians normally, um, at least educated people, uh, know Russian uh, and know English and have uh, all access to CNN, Fox, uh, all these uh, open Facebooks and everything. Uh, normal Russian educated person is bet much better informed than vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis overseas who know only English or in China. Uh, who don't have full access to networks. Uh, this is a structure of the uh, Russian uh, middle class. Uh, we produced with Malava uh, uh, 15 years ago. That's basically a good picture. Uh, so uh, almost 80% of Russians, uh, Russians have at least some, something of a middle class or identification with education professional status of income, only small portion have all three. And pro you may call it a different way, but basically this six, five, six, seven percent is upper middle class, which has everything. And with normal middle class, another 20. So basically affluent Russian society is 30 percent, uh, including one, two percent of really rich people. Uh, that's in our form. Uh, for example, look at the uh, equality, uh, that's World Bank, uh, uh, we had what kind of inequality we had uh, starting off since 20, uh, 1970. Um, World Bank publication of uh, 1998 gave 3% of poor before the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union started and 50% of population of 70 million uh, by uh, 1993. And so we are started with 50% poor, uh, went down to 10% poor by 
statistical standards, more or less internationally accepted. And with the last recession, moved the share of PUI from 10% to 15%. Uh, this is the story on share of wealth. Uh, most countries, rich countries, worked uh, by centuries to create wealth uh, distribution with 80% to 1% uh, of population, 50% or 80% uh, for 10%. The Russians made it in one strike in the 90s, like that, and that's it. And it's rigid. Nothing can be done easily about it. Uh, nothing can be done easily about it. <laughs> I normally ask what to do about it, and I don't tell it. Because uh, I have a couple of recipes, but I know that people who want to read recipient property would use it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I don't tell secrets of that kind. Uh, social stocks up, and current crisis. Uh, this is general picture. BRICS, developed countries. Uh, this is Russian crisis today. Uh, basically, basically, it's very difficult, you see. It's very difficult. A uh, uh, couple industries, big industries growing, agriculture, more or less, uh, partially because of counter sanctions and protection. Uh, mining, uh, all domestic. We, uh, for decades, we're already not talking about gray market. We probably produce much more uh, transportation services, <coughs> construction services, and agricultural products when we register, but nobody cares anymore. Uh, this is uh, how it looks like now by 17. So flat, what is flat is utilities, but it's normally flat. Mining up, uh, manufacturing difficult, and total not. So it's not very bright picture. Uh, but it's L, L, L recession, L recession. Uh, it's better by the end of 17th, but month fluctuation is the problem. Uh, I, since we are not talking the conjuncture problem uh, on a monthly basis, uh, my advice is to look at uh, Russian attitude to the uh, Russian population and academic attitude to the current situation against 90s, and against uh, the 2000, so against the misery uh, we came to, and against some, uh, some level of uh, prosperity reached. This is uh, what I wanted to show you on durables. Uh, we had huge durables boom, once more before the recession 2009, and one bigger uh, after. And the most of the reduction in uh, consumption uh, for, came with a reduction of cons in consumer durables, what is normal for any business cycle. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, poor people have very difficulties in crisis. Uh, what happened that during this boom of 2010-2014, uh, what is very important, some filtering of wealth, in income wealth, and consumer durables came down to the middle of, of the society, not just got stuck in the top 30%, but probably to 50, maybe 60% from the top. Uh, so it's, it's hard to find anybody in Russia now without computer and access to internet, at least that part. And cars, basically, we definitely have uh, not enough roads for these cars. Uh, this is just small things. Um, you know, we have decline of the real income, uh, continuous flat fluctuation of real income, and growing real wages. So government managed and private business managed to keep uh, up um, in the last year the real wages, but decline of some entrepreneurial income and uh, uh, slow growth of pensions uh, created this uh, difference. Uh, this, is, uh, this is CPI. That's interesting. Look at the CPI recorded by uh, standard forms. It's green. And perceptions, uh, expectation and perceptions. Uh, that's uh, sometimes mixing in the, in the media. 
uh, the perceptions are how people respond to surveys. Uh, green is how it's collected by a uh, uh, statistical agency. Uh, and still, this is, it's the lowest inflation probably in the last few years. Uh, this is budget. Budget more or less balanced. Uh, of course, in, de uh, in December, we always have uh, huge payments for the year, so budget pays more. You, you see uh, uh, 17 uh, borrowed uh, again. Uh, I, I don't have December here. We borrowed again. It's, 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 it's seasonal. Uh, but generally, it stands at the pretty low level of about 20 to 20 something percent of GDP. So we have half uh, relation to GDP is probably half of America. Uh, the uh, income, uh, oil income to the budget uh, depends not just on the price of oil in dollars. Uh, income of the budget depends, uh, depending on the price of the barrel in rubles, because taxes are in rubles. Uh, uh, the minimum ruble price for barrel for the equalizing the budget will be about, about around 3,000 uh, rubles per barrel. So if it's $60 um, for barrel and 50 rubles per, per dollar, that's fine, or vice versa. Now it's 58 by 65, it's close to 3,700. It's about enough money for the government to balance the budget. Under current, uh, very strict limitations. Um, uh, analytical agency uh, I am represent, we are working for the government. It's not, I'm not the government service. Uh, but we are paid by the government to, uh, for everyday solution. We don't do any subsidies. We are working for only social economic uh, issues uh, nonstop. It's about 200 people working around the clock. Uh, and, uh, for example, budget was cut in our agency, but not by us. We just organized uh, 40 working groups on 40 big programs. And we are working as a kind of honest advisors. Uh, sometimes if you raise conflicting opinions of the ministers, we may have a working group uh, and we uh, take the records or something. Inter as, a, as organizers, we, are, we don't have any power at all, but we have a lot of uh, professional capability to help the government. It's advertising, sorry. It's advertising. Uh, foreign trade. Uh, since... Um, uh, Import declined with uh, even more than export in dollars. We are in positive uh, in terms of uh, trade balance. Uh, regional inequality, difficult to read. I leave this, uh, of course, for everybody. We, uh, it's very interesting. We made a lot of recalculations uh, and we make a matrix, uh, federal uh, okrugs by type of regions. That, that's my invention. And we uh, we tracking the development of all events in Russia, not only by, re by federal regions uh, geographically, but by type of developed, uh, underdeveloped, and so by s uh, nine, uh, nine type of regions. So it's very interesting. Uh, for, in, for studying Russia, you need to go to regions. It's, it's about the same. So you have developed, middle, and so on and so on. And you may compare. Uh, food, food consumption, non-food consumption per head in rubles and percentage per head. So that's what I'm doing with my stuff, free people strong. Recession and application, I have only one or two slides, and probably I'm getting in time. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So far, so good. But I promised, don't, but don't I, slow down. I promised. <laughs> <laughs> so we read it. <laughs> we may read it. Uh, basically, what I'm saying uh, uh, that one of the role uh, probably I'm playing in this presentation once or twice a year or once in a few years, that uh, it's not a funeral song. Normally, discussion of the Russian economy in Western media is all type of funeral discussion, uh, and sometimes. One of the person I mentioned uh, to you uh, asked me, okay, everybody coming and saying that uh, you're dead. You're not dead. Why? 
So that's why. It's a very rigid uh, society, and with a huge capability to sustain pain and sweet. That's historical. Uh, you know, Americans say, do or die. Uh, I will say how we say it in Russian, and I will translate it just in case. Мы говорим, умри, но сделай. Die, but do. This is a mentality. This is a mentality. I teach a course, in, a different courses in university, including one on comparative analysis, uh, but not Keynes, Hayek, or communism, social, uh, communism, capitalism, but the difference between Anglo-Saxon, continental verum, and Asian market economies, populatology. In English, we have a lot of foreign master program. Uh, we have, so I was to dig into history and mentalities uh, and the difference. Uh, it's a very interesting country. The more I learn about Russia, the more I'm fascinated how people could survive for so long. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Capability, capability uh, to be alerted and uh, to say, okay, and people uh, keep standing, whatever happens. That's, that's came again, that's came again. Uh, and last slide, I want to squeeze the last minute of my, okay, okay. one more, I'll get you. Uh, that's the uh, general uh, message I wanted just because uh, my suggestion is not to discuss topics in the media, which are, uh, or ever, we understand that uh, Western media has everything on Russia except good news. Nothing good ever happened in Russia. Just nothing. Uh, many years ago, I said that Russia presented in the media as an island with pine trees, Putin and oil. No people, no color, no, nothing at all. Uh, actually, life continues. People keep doing interesting things. It's very difficult. It's very difficult recession and everything. But uh, considering uh, the history, it's not the worst time in our history. It's not necessarily the, uh, I, I, I'm not optimistic about perspective on environment for Russia for the next decade. Uh, but f for now, uh, and uh, I have, uh, sorry, but still it's a literature I used. Um, uh, we, we work on inequality, I have a very good stuff, and uh, influence uh, the last uh, word on inequality. We do have a problem that rich people had four or five years for, uh, in middle society for renovating. Uh, household equipment, uh, cars, and everything. And uh, now we are reluctant to go on buying again. We don't need it. And poor people don't have money and even became poorer in this recession. So it's uh, very difficult to push uh, consumers to pull us from the um, these fluctuations to more active um, uh, recovery. And it's very hard to pull investments uh, for the more intensive recovery just because of the corporate structure. That's it. Thank you very much, Lenin. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, you all for uh, a slightly different perspective. So if, if, you'll indulge, if you'll indulge me, I lecture while standing up, so I'll be more comfortable here than there. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> Okay, just those, just gotcha. Okay, so outcomes of inequality in Russia. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Olya, for the invitation. And uh, thank you as well to Leonid for a very interesting presentation. Um, so, essentially, and once it's time to go, just let me know. Um, in this, there is, uh, in the discussion about inequality in Russia, there are basically two questions that Leonid brought up, which I'd like to sort of 
uh, investigate further in terms of what are the political outcomes of inequality. One of the questions that was brought up here is what is normal for Russia? So we also have, you know, Russia nis dayotsa, you know, Russia never gives up. So we have this ability to handle perhaps more inequality than other countries uh, would accept. And we also have sort of this general question of what is going on in Russia? Is this normal for Russia? Is this normal for the political experience of other countries? And, you know, a few of the things that Lenin brought up. One is that widening inequality is in fact normal for a country going to a market economy. And that essentially the level of inequality and the political structure of Russia right now effectively resembles Latin America in lots of different ways. Um, and for those of you interested in Leonid's work, um, he has plenty of written materials, but he has an article in Strategic Analysis from 2016, which is really one of the most easy to understand uh, economic histories of Russia, which I encourage people to read. So in terms of thinking about inequality, there's essentially two questions, or maybe one question that you can ask in two different ways. It is, how much inequality is enough? You want some inequality to incentivize people to do stuff. But you could also ask, how much inequality is too much? If it's too much, that means people think things are unfair. So let's see what sort of like the data also says uh, about this in Russia itself. So the main points, and I'll just have about 10 minutes of discussion so that we can leave as much time for questions as possible, is that inequality in Russia is highly visible. Uh, for those of you who have traveled there or perhaps are from there, uh, one can observe that from the Soviet period, which I did not experience personally, uh, but can certainly see the pictures from the Soviet period, see the pictures from the 1990s, and have lived there, at least myself, over the past couple years, one can see that there is inequality that exists today that did not exist previously. But again, how much is enough? Inequality forms a core aspect of Pre President Vladimir Putin's political coalition. And in this, what I mean is there are haves and have-nots. And what President Putin has done is he's created those who work for the government and those who are basically on the, the lower ends of the economic uh, spectrum. And that's his political coalition. So in effect, the populism that we see in things such as President Putin's May 2012 decrees this is the, essentially the direct redistribution to people at the lower echelons of the, the country, uh, as well as the people who are in government. Third, the inability to reduce social and income inequality is limited by the foreign policy choices. Uh, we're all familiar with what has happened in Ukraine and with Crimea. This puts a crimp in the Russian economy. That's money that's not available for redistribution. That's money that needs to go to maintaining a, let's say, vigorous foreign policy position abroad. You know, that's the cost of sovereignty in a sense. And the fourth thing is um, the key domestic consequence, and this is exactly what Leonid was discussing, the key domestic consequence of social dissatisfaction is increasing attractiveness of populist positions. Populism is a normal consequence, so to speak, of rising inequality. Here in the United States, however, President Trump has actually governed, certainly his key message during the campaign is that inequality exists, my opponent is not paying attention to it, but I'm paying attention to it, um, and I am uh, addressing your economic anxiety. So in a sense, where there is rising inequality, there is a populist outcome. So I apologize if it's uh, difficult to see in the back. Um, but in a sense, this is, uh, and this is the, from uh, Piketty and his uh, Zuckman and their co-authors. This is from the World uh, Inequality Report, uh, the, the next few slides. So here we see average national income per adult in Russia and Western Europe, 1980 to 2016. So we see that although Russia was less wealthy than Western Europe, and that continues to be the case, and it declined in the 1990s, it has become far wealthier today. Again, I was not there during the Soviet period, but I've been to Russia and the regions right now. I cannot even imagine what it used to be. But right now, middle-income country, things are mostly fine. And so what we see is uh, that Russia has gained on Western Europe and sort of keeps that track. And of course, a little dip there, that's the 2008 financial crisis. 
We also see that a key social achievement of the USSR, social quality, has been reversed. And what this graph shows is this is the top 10% income share in France, Russia, and the US, 1905. So for those of you who are interested in history, the name is Vite Stolipin, from their era, when they were trying to reduce social inequality and income inequality by giving land to the peasants so that peasants would own something and have a stake in Russia's future. The unhappy outcome of the Stilipin reforms helps explain the sort of growing populist demand for change, which you know, one thing led to another. That's the Bolshevik Revolution. But what we see here is that from 1905, inequality just plummets. Um, and from the Soviet period, and especially from after new economic policy, throughout the Soviet period, um, inequality, the, the share of income held by the top 10% is fairly low. Sort of just also as an aside, thinking about the United States, which is the blue, uh, you'll notice that income inequality goes down some, sometime in the 1930s. Well, those, that's the New Deal talking. And uh, in 1980, it starts to go up. So that's, uh, that's President Reagan coming in. Um, so we can see that that's where the, that's where the money's going. Um, and in a sense, as, a, as I was mentioning before, the return of social inequality is highly visible. Um, for those of you who've been even to a wealthy city such as Moscow, you can see the center of Moscow. This is like Paris, this is Rome, at all the, all the high fancy shops that you can imagine. But if you go to the end of the line, uh, you go to um, Butova or something, it gets pretty grim pretty quickly. So you can see it there. And so the income shares in Russia from 1905 to 2015, the top 10%, as I said, went down. The middle 40 and the bottom 50, they gained. Social, inequal social inequality was reduced. Uh, but at the end of the Soviet period, the, the middle 40 did a bit worse. The bottom 50 did much worse. And so that income went to the top 10%. So in essence, this is what we see. This is the story that we can tell from the Soviet period to the 1990s, to the privatization of oligarchs. That's how things shifted out. And so this is where we get to the current day, and this is where we start to see what is, like, why do we see sort of increasing social dissatisfaction and the increasing popularity of populism. Uh, so this is from Levada Center. Um, it sort of goes on for a bit more. Do you agree or disagree with the opinion that Russia is currently experiencing an economic crisis? So it starts in October 2014. So this is, in fact, a post-sanctions environment. And we go from essentially 60% saying yes to around 80 to uh, around 80% uh, for the rest of the time. This is what people can observe. The economy used to be better. Now it's not as good. What are the outcomes that we can do from this? And so this comes from, I just took this picture from uh, Vietnamisti. It's a Russian uh, business newspaper. Um, so do you believe that Russia needs substantial changes or does it need stability? Here's, so here's the consequence. And this is, um, it says, changes or stability, uh, what do Russians want? And the red, as you can see there in 1999, the red 69%, um, the country needs uh, substantial changes. And in the blue, it says the country needs uh, stability. The uh, Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Sociology has done this, this panel research, which is they ask the same survey questions to people year after year after year to see how changes long term um, are reflected in society. So for the first time since 1999, oh, before President Putin came in, or then Prime Minister Putin, to 2017, the success of the country on the macro scale which was experienced effectively 2000 through 2017, let's say, this is when people want stability. They want the changes that they've observed to actually stick, to keep going. And from 1999 to 2017, this is the first time that it's flipped back towards changes. So we start to see that essentially rising inequality amongst many things gets people thinking, can we do better? Can we do differently? And so this is just the same thing, but I just translated it, um, but I explained it. 
Um, and so we start to see what are sort of the cracks in the political coalition. Um, for those of you who follow Russian politics, this was um, sort of a sort of big to do or big sort of scandal uh, last year. Um, and the sort of anti-government activist or political candidate, uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, and just to be super explicit, Alexei Navalny is outside of the political mainstream. Um, he's had legal, legal difficulties, whether they were imposed or self-accepted, but he will not be running for president uh, this year. He keeps wanting to run for president, he keeps wanting to enter politics, uh, but so far he's not been allowed to. And one of the reasons that he's not been allowed to is that he brings an explicitly populist message. His message is, effectively you can say two, th two things about him. One is that he's against government corruption, and two, that he's for revising, essentially Russia's relationship with the near abroad and the West. Particularly when it comes to people from Central Asia and the North Caucasus, he went from being fairly unknown person to using the phrase Khvatit Karmit Kafkaz, stop feeding the Caucasus. So he has basically these two, both in terms of racial anxiety and economic anxiety, he has a full uh, program. And in this, he used drone technology and some forensic accounting to show that there is a very good chance that Prime Minister Medvedev has done extremely well for himself in terms of real estate and yachts and so forth. This caused a huge number of protests across uh, the Russian Federation, sort of one of these huge um, spontaneous protest movements. So, you know, and that's going towards the political coalition of, the, of President Putin. And the reform plans are limited by foreign policy choices. Again, with Ukraine and Crimea, we, we, we could sort of discuss for a long time, good idea, bad idea, but the point of the matter is, this has happened. This is extremely important to Russia's definition of sovereignty, of national dignity. And so, in effect, Crimea, which used to be part of Ukraine, which is now part of Russia, and the Kerch Strait Bridge, which I wanted to highlight, in order to have a physical symbol of bringing Crimea to reabsorb it back into the Russian Federation, this is an acknowledgment that uh, a number of the sanctions, uh, an amount of the tension with the West, that this is something that Russia and Russians, Russian leadership is willing to hang on to. That, you know, as, um, as Leonid this described before, there's a lot that basically Russians will accept that perhaps other countries won't. That's part of it. That willing to hang on to Crimea is that important. Um, and so part of, so, you know, reform plans limited by foreign policy choices, and just to show what is at the current moment outside of the political mainstream, and this is my last uh, slide, is these are a number, I just took it directly from Alexei Navalny's, um, his campaign manifesto. So as I said, he is not going to officially run for president, but he is running on this anti-corruption platform, and his actual you know, policy promises um, are explicitly populist. If you look at you know, post-World War II uh, Latin America, you'd see this. And th there's a number of things about redistribution, like directly from the rich to the, to the poor, but just th what I bolded for you, um, fighting corruption through expropriation, directly. This is the first Russian politician to call for expropriation since, uh, since Lenin. Just to show you, this is where he's, these are the buttons he's pushing. Through expropriation of state officials, reducing the state bureaucracy, cutting subsidies to state corporations, raising taxes on the gas sector, on dividends paid by state companies, on previously privatized state resources, and on luxury items. And then finally, uh, reduce or eliminate state officials, law enforcement and judicial officials, and mass media, what he calls propagandists. This is expropriation, this is lustration. This is a reflection of some percentage of the Russian electorate, which wants to see direct changes in the redistribution within Russia itself. So in terms of Russia being a normal country, well, sort of normal populism. So with that time, I will yield to Olya. Thank you. Uh, Yvonne, uh, thank you very much. Leonid, uh, welcome back uh, to the stage. Um, I think you need to get your microphone turned back on. Is that, okay, let's, let's do that. 
Um, so I, I thought that those were two very, um, very interesting presentations. Um, I am, uh, I am going to uh, use my um, moderator's prerogative um, to um, make sure that nobody drives out of here accidentally following directions from uh, Siri or Google Maps or whatever else. Um, so. Um, Lillian, you mentioned the uh, you mentioned sanctions as a miracle in disguise. I think most of us who follow the Russian economy understand the logic between that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit, though, about whether you think the benefits of sanctions, the development of certain sectors as a result of sanctions, has any impact on inequality specifically, um, or whether it, j it just feeds into the pre-existing system, which is, as you said, fairly static um, and just helps reinforce it? Well, uh, as I said, uh, well, we have two types of sanctions. One type of sanctions is financial, which is normally difficult because it's, uh, we were cut from access to the low interest rate uh, borrowings. Uh, that's obvious. But we export capital. So we, uh, if we have a problem with finance, it's because we don't use our own funds properly. We don't borrow much. Second, uh, technology sanctions, which basically we read like an attempt to prevent us from becoming more advanced technological country. Uh, for this case, it's definitely a miracle in disguise because we could sleep out. Uh, now everybody woke up. Uh, and countries were, for example, we never, uh, Russian oil companies just borrowed uh, technology, purchased technology from Halliburton or um, this uh, French company, uh, Fonberger. Uh, Fonberger? Fonberger. Uh, but we, wait, 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 ice cream. It's not Fonberger. Fonberger? Fabergé? Huh? Yeah, it's French. Yeah, it's French. Anyway, okay, anyway, anyway your company was doing, uh, do, uh, was making two billion dollars a year in Russia. So Russian oil companies just purchase technology and stop uh, and stop paying uh, to uh, research and development uh, uh, institutes in Russia. And I, I was present for decades for complaints of Russian research institute in technologies, but we are losing the capability to drill uh, because companies are buying ready equipment from the West. Now everybody doing something. Nobody knows anymore because it's now kind of problem of security and surviving the country. So people switched to thinking and alerted. In this uh, respect, that's the, ma the main result of sanctions. People started think and fight psychologically uh, and trying to do something about it. It has nothing to do with inequality, of course. Uh, um, Putin's uh, government tried to uh, raise salary of uh, state services, uh, but main inequality, of course, coming not from the state services. It's, it's, it's big, uh, we have 40 huge corporations mostly for private and state, and we have inequality in built in them, of course. And all our oligarchs are not state oligarchs, except for hiding corrupt people, but uh, basically it's so obvious, everybody knows, that half of them living here. Uh, some of them just moved here, sold the property in Russia, got the uh, 10, 20 billion dollars, and happily comment on the Russian events. That's the problem. It's 90s. Uh, uh, let me repeat one point. Oh, you love Russian privatization? In this case, don't laugh on Russian oligarchs. It's a part of Russian privatization. And Russian inequality came from 90s. In the, okay. whatever so you, I, 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 but, no, okay. no, no. Whatever you do, you cannot uh, assign inequality to Putin. He's dealing with it one or another way, bad to bad. Sanctions brought, ah, you mean industries. Well, mining and research and development I mentioned. Agriculture. Agriculture, very interesting. 
uh, grain was developed by itself. We now export a huge amount of grain, like Russia before the revolution, uh, low quality, by the way, but still. Uh, few sectors developing. First, Parmesan. Uh, when sanctions came and counter sanctions against European Parmesan was introduced by the Russian government, liberals were very angry on the absence of, par of Parmesan in the shops in Moscow. After that, Russian businessmen imported masters of Parmesan from Italy. And now, Parmesan is fine. It's import substitution. Fine is strong. It works. Market works. Uh, second, <laughs> pork and chickens. Instead of import uh, and butter. Instead of importing subsidized American, uh, you know, bush legs, so-called chickens, and European uh, and ports of many countries, uh, we had huge reserve facilities already had built before the sanctions on chickens and pork, I mean, and we're I'm, working. I'm going to stop you, because what Sorry. I'm interested in is, is this inequality question. And I, I just want to confirm that what you're saying is all of this is happening, but it's being distributed the same way wealth has been distributed up until now. It's going into that same system where you, you know, the rich, the rich, rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. Yes, that's what exactly I was saying for okay. all my lecture. The system are based on the property distribution of 90s. This property distribution created certain culture of corporate governance. Mm -hmm. And in this culture, the system of inequality became rigid. Putin or no put Putin, it's the market economy we got by ourselves. It's, uh, we, uh, we may blame 90s or whatever, but it's our market economy which came uh, with us. It, you cannot change it easily, not by the government, not by uh, Navalny is a, is a marginal figure, uh, very strange. I know him. I was a couple of times on uh, Echo Moscow with him. He is an interesting man. He, of course, it's, it's good we have him. We, uh, now we have Sobchak. Uh, I don't know why you're advertising Navalny. He's irrelevant. Why, where is the program of Sobchak girl? Uh, uh, she's kind of Zhirinovsky for girls. <laughs> uh, we have a, a huge entertainment this year for uh, okay. presidential uh, elections. I think, I think I'm going to switch to you yeah. all here. Um, <laughs> With, with a question um, about, well, following, up, following on the Navalny, not, not so much on the Subchak. Um, uh, so, I mean, you, you've described Navalny's platform as a combination of racism and populism. I mean, he's, to be fair, he has really backed away from the racism mm -hmm. and the, you know, kind of the statements about North Caucasian, the people from Central Asia are something that's pretty much fallen out sure. of his public statements in, since, since he started really running. Um, and I think we can think of a lot of reasons for that, but most of it is about being palatable to a broader range of people. Um, and what um, what I'm curious about, and this this kind of feeds back into Leonid's, Leonid describes a system that's very static, and I think you agree with that. Navalny wants to break it. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see alternatives to Navalny's populist approach to breaking it uh, coming out of the state at all, or do you see the static uh, nature of the Russian economy continuing? Well, I think the, the, the past 18 years have shown that what President Putin inherited from the 1990s is the idea that it's not so much there will be elites and like non-elites fighting each other, but that without sort of like that one strong leader, the elites will kill each other. And so what I believe that sort of Putin has not just said, but sort of what people uh, say of him, including insiders, is that his one big thing is to adjudicate disputes at the very top so that they don't spill out into the different social classes or actually onto the streets. So in terms of um, is there a, ch a possibility of change from within, the change that President Putin has always said that he wants is essentially this very slow, evolutionary, you know, incremental change. Except we're not seeing that. So we're not seeing it because that Sounds also- Sounds like Chinese. Yeah, so in, the, so in that same sense, that also looks like an no. argument for no change. And what 
what is sort of like the, uh, I guess, both the danger and attraction of someone like Navalny or any generic populist, someone who comes from outside the system, is that, he's, is that anyone who comes from outside the system says, look, we could talk about evolutionary change until we're all gray here. But the point is, if we actually want change, then we need to see it. And the system is set up to oppose any individual making either a left-wing uh, perspective on that or a right-wing perspective on that. Because for as much as you know, people criticize President Putin for lots of different things, but in terms of his inter-ethnic sort of positions or rhetoric, he generally hasn't gone, gone there, as it were. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, so he has to be the president of all Russians, and Alexei Navalny or people like him are not in this context. I, I completely don't understand why we are talking Navalny if we are talking about I Russian think economy. Talk, I think we're just talking about populism. No, no, it, it, fine, but it, 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 he's uh, kind of uh, in this proportion. We have new figure in these elections, greedy. Uh, we have, so the classic combination was Putin, Zhirinovsky, Zuganov, Yevlinsky, uh, Mironov. Five million. People got tired of them, of course. Now we don't have Zuganov. Uh, we, Yevlinsky, probably have uh, less chances than usual. But we have greedy. Who is popu populist? Is greedy. Uh, he's in system. He's uh, we, uh, on the ticket of Communist Party. Uh, so we have left populist, what is normal for the country with our background. Instead of extremely boring uh, Zuganov, his kind of uh, what, uh, and ex extremely uh, um, energetic uh, Zhirinovsky, we have a greeting who is populist, anti-oligarch, uh, much more uh, reliable, he's successful um, uh, manager, uh, in farming, and, and he is completely has no deviation of, from Putin on foreign policy. And that's it. This is a, this is a campaign. Forget Navalny. Why you need this entertainment at Do all? Do you want to respond to that? Just one of them. Okay, so I'm going to let you all respond, and then I'll go in terms and so of all of you. In that general sense, you know, not to say that Navalny is this key political figure in Russia right now, but in the, but the general point, I think, of what both Leonid and I would, would agree upon is that in this general sense, the pie is shrinking and there's, there isn't social agreement that the social contract is being maintained. No, no, no. And, like that, and so in that context, that's essentially what provides this political space for populism writ large. Well, we, uh, Olga, okay, we are I talking economics or I politics here. I don't think thinks there's space for we populism. We are talking economics well, or politics. Uh, what I would say is that the pie is shrinking. So it's not. It's not. Oh. Pi is not shrinking. Okay, so pi is either shrinking or not shrinking. Yeah. Let's open this up for discussion. Um, already right here in front. Yeah. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Please uh, say your name and affiliation if you have one. Please make it a question. Um, I'm Dr. Mindy Reiser. I worked in uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus. I'm going to ask a wonky question about methodology, okay? We are concerned in the United States that the census in 2020 may be politically distorted. I don't need to go into that. I'm curious in terms of the integrity of the data that you work with. How is it collected? Who are the people who are doing it? What kind of constraints there are? Your work is very impressive, but I'd like to dig under it and see how it was collected and organized and verified. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, very simple. What is inside Russia, normally collected by statist Rostatos, Rossiski, Russian Statistical Agency, uh, we don't have big complaints about it. We, are, we have a lot of questions, how we do this and that, but there is no general suspicion of manipulating the data. What we did, but it's transparent, we changing once in 10 years and five years the proportions uh, how we calculate indexes. But it's all agencies do it. Uh, so it's not difficult to learn how we just call them uh, or buy the data from them and we will show you how we, what we're doing. Second, we definitely not covering everything produced in the country. Uh, but it's, 
for no clear reason. For years, I never heard about uh, gray area or uh, non-registered. But historically, point, pictures from points of uh, land and use uh, gave much more acreage than collected by the data. So definitely, we underestimate Russian GDP and Russian, especially agricultural production. What is basically uh, areas of hidden of hidden output not registered. Construction, transportation, agriculture, all around the world. We definitely have it. And the more taxes, the diff more difficult times, more Italy of 60s, hiding some production. Second, uh, GDP per capita in PPP in international dollars. That's not our job. It's the job of international organization. We recalculated all the numbers in 2011, and now we, if you saw the jump in, on uh, this, uh, uh, because it's a jump uh, from two different estimations. Uh, before uh, 11, we were 16,000 uh, dollars per head, GDP per capita, PPP, in, by international. Now, out of a sudden, we 24, 25. How it's constructed? Uh, we calculate numbers, but we make additional estimations on the use of housing, on housing, education, and health care. Uh, so it's imputed co uh, output. Uh, and the countries with the Soviet, uh, the socialist background, naturally have better housing, uh, education, and health care than most of the developing world. And out of a sudden, in uh, recently, all these countries jumped up by international standards. So GDP per capita, that's not Russian work. It's international estimations. So you may basically rely on monthly fluctuations, and you basically may decline on main thing. If something is wrong, uh, we have a lot of surveys. It's open, people, you saw this uh, CPI uh, imputed by Rostat and CPI estimated by uh, polls by Fzeom uh, or anybody else. So it, it's easy. It's pretty open country. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Oh, please wait for the microphone. Yes. It's me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Shlomo Weber, New Economic School. Moscow. Uh, so we talked about socioeconomic foundations, socioeconomic factors, and I'm really shocked that uh, you haven't mentioned one of them. It's a human capital. Human capital. So investment in human capital in, a, in education. So if, you know, we don't have to go like, what, 50 something years, then the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States in terms of the overall human capital. So the question was, we we couldn't use it, this capital in order to advance the country. So the question is, I think it's not the question, but probably the statement is that without investment in human capital, there is no hope. And, but with the proper investment, there is a hope, and it's actually a bright hope ahead. Well, human capital situation is the following. Uh, schools are slightly down because of reforms. I don't like Russian educational reforms in high schools. Uh, introducing the standard exam helped uh, some provinces, uh, but damaged it the best. So I teach first, I teach, I give enormous number of lectures to first graders and bachelors to cure them from uh, high school exams. Because they're learning something uh, like in all Japanese school, uh, just to memory a lot of things for exams. That's nonsense. It's good for average. It's very bad for best. But best are very survivable. So I teach, I coming in the 1st of September and say, I will cure you from your exams in a few months. You just forget it, everything, and not, not forget. Because you learn to make it for crosswords, I will uh, teach you how to use it in connection. So children are the same. Children good. School slightly down on the average, best schools are excellent. Universities, <clears throat> it's a problem, but 
uh, there is a, re a recombination and best, best unions now in Moscow, mostly Moscow, not the, even St. Petersburg. It's a bit, they will kill me, but it's true. Uh, most, it's a high school of economics, Moscow State University. It's a huge queuing. Um, Middle East biological laboratories in the United States speak Russian, educated in Moscow State University. Uh, Germany uh, has plans to import thousands of Russian engineers because we keep producing them. So this side, we don't use them properly. So we uh, keep exporting brains. We export oil, money, and brains. Uh, we, don't know, we don't do anything else. But we're still doing brains, and we'll keep doing brains. Uh, there is financial trap for, um, on my students. Uh, Middle-ranking students stay on the West because it's financial trap. They cannot come back for the same salary. Who is returning? The very best. Because we are Russians, we don't have now career. Only who immigrated in the uh, 90s, 90s, we made a career on the West, that's fine with them. Now, uh, attempt to make a career on the West are difficult for Russians, so the very best of my pupils are back to Moscow. I am completely happy. Thank you for sanctions. Yuval, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, that's scary. Okay, let's, um, okay, uh, Cyrus has, yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Um, the description you provided, um, Leonid, and uh, Yuva's uh, commentary, uh, made me wonder, looking forward, um, the, the descriptions were very interesting, analysis was interesting, but it makes me wonder, and when I traveled to Russia, I asked myself the same question. Okay, Russia, brought itself up to be a major importer of oil and gas, as Mr. Putin said, the energy superpower. Russia is exporting other raw materials as it did for centuries. Russia is exporting brains as it does since 1917. What are the foci of growth going forward? Where is the robotics? Where is the fi fintech? where is space, the space industry people, I talked to insiders of space industry, Westerners who do business with Russia, says so space industry is deteriorating fast. What are the foci of high tech growth 10, 20, 30 years forward? Thank you. Uh, in the future. 10, 20, 30 years yeah. forward. Uh, well, first it's a question, of course, to Mr. Kudrin who is developing the program for the next presidency. I was, part, I was head of the working group on energy, but energy doesn't produce high rate of growth just because uh, no physically, no financially, we don't expect high jumps. Uh, we are trying uh, to make a maneuver uh, to reduce government spendings, on, especially on pensions, restructuring pension age and everything, uh, and uh, invest more in the economy. It's difficult. It's difficult to answer. Uh, but uh, my point, I, it's not my intention to create the happy picture of what we are uh, out of the trouble in growing. No, no, no. We have a lot of problems. Uh, we are uh, in the difficult recovery, but difficult recovery. Uh, and we will be, we have still huge potential for infrastructure, for modernization, practically of all industries, because we have all tails. Uh, if, say, you know, best existing equipment or technology, the idea of best existing, if we would change current technology for best existing technology, that would be a huge jump in almost everywhere. Uh, plus uh, roads, uh, housing. Uh, we jumped from 21.5 square meters per head to 24.5 square meters to three, three square meters in the recent 10 years. What is something? Uh, and uh, it's not just Moscow which is prospering. Basically, million, big million-sized uh, cities are 
uh, operation, uh, operational, I would say, uh, growing. Uh, but it's, uh, we are in the process of adjustment to this, uh, this level of oil government spending. Country not spending too much. It's not Brazil, not Greece. We don't, we, we keep, uh, we keep um, uh, Maastricht's norms, essentially, for borrowing. We, we could be accepted to the uh, European Union by inflation, by the debt. We don't have, we don't have state debt. Uh, well, you have here some debt. Yeah, I remember. I wrote an article on American debt. Uh, uh, we have 15% of debt to GDP. Practically nothing. Practically nothing. So we have a lot of, uh, the problem, I believe the main problem is corporate governance connected to the ownership structure and the rigidity of social structure. Um, uh, and you can easily judge the quality of human capital. We don't use it, but how good are people abroad? How good are our students? You want? Yeah, so just quickly on the same subject, we, so from essentially that answer and the, and the previous question, the, the human capital of Russia is phenomenal. Um, just as a personal aside, I taught at New Economic School, taught at Higher School of Economics, taught at Harvard University, and particularly those undergrads that have had it all three places are about the same. Like the students at the very top of Russia are phenomenal. What we also observe, so we have this sort of this structural base to build on. But what we see in that was sort of, it was in Lenin's last answer, is that there's an institutional problem. How do you take someone who's super smart, lives close by to other super smart people, that's how you should get the agglomeration in order to build something bigger, particularly in IT and all these other sectors. And you see these, these, these companies and these sectors start to come up, and essentially they don't develop. And so what we observe, particularly with like these really high profile persons like, like Pavel Durov, who is uh, this IT, you know, I guess this, this IT superstar in Russia, is once he got too big, he ran into difficulties. And so that's essentially that middle level where the companies don't take off or the sectors don't take off is where the talent is there, the enthusiasm is there, there's sporadic amounts of funding coming from the government in different projects, but it isn't able to go all the way through. And that's, I think, where, you're, where essentially it dies on the vine, just effectively in the middle of things. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. A technical but nonetheless substantive question. When you use the a Gini coefficient on income, are you using that of unadjusted market income or adjusted uh, income adjusted for taxes and transfers? I ask that because in a number of other countries, including the United States, places like South Africa, the difference between those two uh, genies is often quite dramatic. So are you looking basically at market income or are you looking at consumption? It's uh, a good question. I believe it's income you know, for a start. It's income, not, not consumption. Uh, but what is important, uh, genie is convenient coefficient for academics. But it's for some, because it's, uh, everybody knows what is it, they use it. Uh, correlation between the share of 10% in income to Gini, roughly 0 0.9 globally, if you take by countries. So basically it's the same. But it's much more educative, uh, share of 10 deaths, so it's much more educative because you can see it, just not hidden by some coefficient. For example, South Africa, uh, you mentioned. 10% uh, of population are white people, and they have 52% of income. It's a global record. Uh, uh, normally, if you look uh, carefully, it, I call it the, the enigma, of, uh, enigma of the ninth decile. Normally, all around the world, the ninth decile is 15% of income. Quite rare, 13 or 17, normally 15. So as soon as you have 32% for the United States, or 33%, plus 15, it's 48. So the whole variety you have in the re for the rest, 80% of population, just 
give it to Jimmy. Really, the whole inequality sits with the 10% of the richest 10%. Mm -hmm. Yuval, do you have anything to add to that? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if we can get more questions. Let's, um, yeah, I'm actually going to take uh, three questions and then we'll bring it back to the audience so that we have time for more. So, in the back there, gentleman in the black. Hello there, uh, Kevin Doyle, master's student at Harvard. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the regions obviously are a huge part of the, the inequality picture. How do you think the Russian government is proposing to develop the regions in an equal way? I mean, obviously, you talked about Moscow having the best and brightest, but how do you get that out of places that are not Moscow? Let's take two more. Um, Jeff. Thanks. Jeff Mankoff at CSIS. This is really a question, I, more for you all, but I'd be curious to hear from both of you about it. Um, Leonid, you mentioned that inequality has become sort of a structural feature in Russia and that it's relatively baked into the way that people's expectations are structured, whereas Yuval, your, your perspective was that this actually is more of a political problem, and things like Navalny are indicative of, of how inequality is becoming a political problem. So what I'd be curious to hear from you is, apart from expropriation, um, what are some concrete steps that a Russian government could take to address the problem of, of inequality? And Leonid, I guess my question for you would be, if inequality is not a major political problem right now, how would we know when it is? What are the things that we should look for um, if inequality is going to become a source of wider political instability? Okay, great. And uh, if you want to just pass the microphone back behind you, Jeff. Hi, uh, Dmitry Pirovzhensky, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your talks. My question is about Russia's exports and imports. You talked about their substance of the exports. I was wondering if you could talk about the source and the destination of the exports and imports. Have, has that changed at all since the sanctions were introduced? Is there more trade with Asia, or things like that? Thank you. Well, uh, let's start uh, with the end. Uh, we normally import European consumer goods. Uh, Russians with money don't buy American or Chinese, just European. The whole Moscow is, no, no not, not, not in Moscow. Uh, so uh, consumer goods mostly European, uh, cars and everything. Uh, uh, but we have, uh, we buy a lot of, a lot of supplies, uh, we don't produce everything. Um, uh, on export, uh, we uh, sell a lot of grain, especially to developing countries, uh, and uh, sometimes probably as a f feed for animals. Um, uh, oil uh, distributed in a different way, uh, mostly in Europe. Uh, Europe, um, Asian big, uh, developing, uh, and uh, the shift to Asia happens. Well, I don't keep exact numbers. Uh, when uh, we had big, um, high price of oil, we bu were buying much more from China than now. Uh, and China is supplying a lot of more sophisticated goods. Uh, but we don't have too many people on the west, uh, on the east of the country. And the Russian businessmen are building uh, um, plants in China. So we are investing in China, uh, especially on the coal's range, using cheap Chinese labor force to import. So it, it's, it's lively, but it's a beginning. We are restructuring to the East. We are not independent of the world. We are one of the most probably um, uh, open economy because it's a huge uh, share of export import to GDP. It's very, it's very high. Uh, so for us, adjustment to uh, low price of oil, sanctions, uh, regional limitations, expected uh, possible regional limitations are difficult. We are working on it. Now, on uh, in what government can do about inequality and regional inequality. Regional inequality is being handled in a very simple, uh, straightforward way. Uh, government invests a lot uh, to North Caucasus, no, South Russia, North Caucasus regions, 
and to far, uh, a far east to Pacific regions. So a, mine, a lot of money moves there and for consumption and for uh, investments. And uh, this, uh, my, uh, my methodology of um, uh, watching regions not only by geography but by uh, type of regions, it's very simple. All the, uh, all the business fluctuations only in the rich regions. So poor regions don't experience uh, business fluctuations. It's flat because we are subsidized uh, from the rest of the country. It's flat situation or better. It's strictly by size on the region. On inequality, government is reluctant uh, to go on big redistribution of income. Uh, let me remind, we have 13% flat income personal tax, 13%. Uh, government tries to put tax on this, on that, um, on businesses, uh, but still doesn't touch it. And nobody will touch it, I believe, before uh, 20, uh, 2014, uh, 20, 2024. I mean, not before the next, next president, whoever he is. As Obama said once, it was whoever she is, but whoever he is, uh, because it's definitely not for presidential elections now. Uh, I would uh, move uh, tax to 20, uh, from 15 to 20 people would live with it. Uh, but nobody would touch it for uh, now, for, for sure. By the way, all these populists t talking, uh, all these uh, general nonsense, let's liquidate bureaucracy, let's fight corruption, nothing, spe nothing specific, interesting. No, uh, communists never suggested nationalization. Uh, nice, uh, I would say, home communists never asking for nationalization of a big property. Fine. Uh, nobody uh, suggesting, um, actually, there is no issue of progressive tax in the elections. And nothing like that. So uh, it's not the redistribution. If we are fighting inequality, we must create uh, what actually Ariel was asking about. We need to create industries, enterprises, jobs, and to move people uh, up in income according to education and the uh, quality of production. Yeah, and uh, if I still can answer Jeff and Kevin's uh, questions together, or at least address them together. Um, so I've been working on this book on the structure of economic reform in Russia from like the Stalipin period to the present. And so part of it was looking at what is happening right now with the current economic reform program. And in front of President Putin, President Putin has gotten three different basically points of view together. One is like this super um, like classical liberal a plan from Alexei Kudrin. Uh, Boris Titov and Sergei Glazyev have this sort of very loose money, just the government needs to intervene in everything. And Maxim Maryeshkin, who's the current uh, governor of uh, economic development, is basically stay the course. So you have, was it? Minister. What did I say? He said governor. But oh, pardon me, minister. He's a, he's a minister. Um, we're, the, we're the same age, so I'm doing great. Uh, so, um, but in all... But in all three, I was looking at their direct programs and trying to see, was there any actual overlap? And literally the one thing that all three, from basically all across the political spectrum, the only thing that they all agreed upon was the number of inspections that a business, a physical business can be liable for, is excessive. And so at these small, medium, and even large size enterprises, the ability of a fire inspector or a health inspector to walk in and basically call for a full inspection of everything, thus providing either a, a difficult economic choice or basically an opportunity for this particular inspector for self-enrichment. That was the only thing that every single um, economic plan held in common, that that's a thing that can change. Uh, so so it is, if I may. Um, so in terms of what, what are concrete steps, basically if the government can follow that particular point, which all three said. In terms of what is the regions, what we've seen is that within sort of like regional inequality, you just have pockets of the country which are not connected to the international economy. So a thing that two of the three had suggested is basically like here in the United States, throw internet and broadband access to places that are more remote so that you can leverage the human capital that exists 
in a regional city or in some village, but which is not connected basically to the world economy, get those people online so that they can contribute, have online businesses, Are they not online? I mean, when I've traveled through Russia, people are online. They might still be walking outside to use the toilet, but they've got the internet set up. So that, so that level of mm -hmm. access is, is inconsistent. And that's the sort of thing that can be, that, that's like a policy step that could reduce inequalities between regions. Uh, one technical remark on the difference between free names and free programs. Kudrin was charged with a special task to create the program for 2018, 2024, for the next presidency, wherever he is. Uh, Areshkin uh, became minister out of the sudden because of Ulukaev case. And uh, as soon as he adjusted himself, he's the first minister educated in high school of economics. We are very proud. Uh, and he's very young. Uh, he has a mandate to produce a strategy, economic strategy for Russia till 2035. That's his job. Uh, so what is happening essentially in Moscow is attempt to create on one side the program for the next presidency and to make it, as we were instructed, in a way consistent with the uh, 2035 horizon. Uh, it's still not finished. We don't have uh, it's all delivered probably uh, up with, uh, on the high level, uh, but uh, we will see close to elections and right after elections. Since we basically know who is going to win elections, uh, we, what we observe, changing of governors, deputy ministers. So it's the process of readjusting the uh, management goes on and younger people coming. We have more, what's good maybe, good news is that we have more uh, people age 35, 40 coming from nowhere. In the morning I was on Brazilian corruption seminar in World Bank. So it's a problem how to change the system if the system is corrupt to bring young people who is not yet enough corrupt or whatever. So what we observe is by bringing more te technical stuff, uh, professionals not connected to big companies to, uh, to big money. So um, to create the management in regions and in the uh, central uh, ministries uh, not connected to the other sources uh, of income or history, without history of uh, connections. So that, that's what is happening on bureaucratic level. We will see how probably next president by spring will come up with the strategy of the six years or maybe uh, he will allow Minister of Economy to bring uh, directly to 2035. Glazyev is a voice without a program. Forget it. Uh, he's an interesting man. I know him since he was a student. Uh, he has certain position, he has no program at all. It's just a manifesto. Uh, because he has nobody who is sitting, working, no money working on him. That, that, that was just uh, um, uh, in newspapers. On that um, rather uh, pessimistic note, um, I, think I, uh, I think we're out of time. So um, I would like to ask the audience to join us in thanking our uh, presenters today for, I think, a very useful and welcome conversation.